Good morning and welcome. Thank you all for coming out again today. Uh, as I always say, it's such a privilege. You know, you don't appreciate what you have sometimes until you don't have it. Just to be able to gather together in the name of Jesus physically is like, uh, it's one thing to be together electronically, uh, and that's okay, but there's nothing like being physically together. That's why the book of Hebrews tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but to exhort one another daily and so much more as we see as the day of preaching. And, uh, you know, we all add to each other. You might think, well, I'm not preaching or I'm not doing the worship. The worship team's doing the worship. But when you're together and you talk before the service and after the service and just being together, uh, God has a wonderful plan and it's, it's, it's great for us to be together. So let's bow our heads in prayer before we look into the word of God today. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for who you are, for your plan, for your great plan of grace that uh, even though we were your enemy, we reconciled you by the death of Christ. And now that we're reconciled, we are saved by the life of Christ, the life of Christ in us. Jesus died to take away our sins, to remove the wall that was between us, and he rose from the grave to give us life. We were spiritually dead, and now we have Christ in us, our hope of glory. Thank you for that. As we look into your word today, open up our hearts and minds, make it a reality. And whenever we look into your word, Lord, help us not to say, okay, I'm going to improve on this. Help us say we can't change ourselves. We're already changed when we accepted Christ. We were buried with Christ, and we rose with Christ in us. And help us to just see we just need to surrender more. We cannot produce fruit. We cannot change anything. You do that. Help us to rest in you, to enter into rest. You said, he that is entering into God's rest has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Help us to cease from our works and let you do it, just to surrender to you fully. We thank you, Jesus' name. Amen. So the thought of our message today, as you can see on the, on the picture, of the, the unity of the Spirit. The unity of Spirit. I like this picture because it shows, and, and I hate to say the word racist because there are no races of people. That, that all came from Charles Darwin and from some, from some others. There's only one race, and that's a human race. God created one race, one blood. And uh, Dr. Ken Ham wrote a great book. It's a children's version and a grown-ups version called One Blood. I encourage you to get that book and to read it and to read it to your children. There are not races of people. That's the works of the, the elitists and others who want to divide people because you can only control people when you divide them. There's one race of people with different pigmentation and other characteristics. There's one race, and we're all God's people. We who receive Christ should be in the unity of spirit. See, there is no unity without the Holy Spirit of God. The works of the flesh are always going to be manifest with division and fighting and, and turmoil and lust and greed and taking advantage of one another, but the Spirit of God brings unity. See, there's, there's three persons in the Godhead. God the Father, that's the Father of God, the Son of God, the Holy Spirit of God. These three are one. They are one. Jesus said in the real Lord's Prayer, John 17, Father, let those whom you have given me be one with me, as I am one with you, that they may be one with us, one with us, one with us. We need to be in the unity of spirit. That unity comes only by the Holy Spirit. That's where the true unity comes. So may God help us as we look into this message to understand this truth. I'm going to start out with a beautiful verse. In fact, there's a short psalm. Read the whole psalm, but I'm going to read, I'm going to read verse 1 of Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now, I think we've all experienced the opposite. Uh, I've been talking to people now, and with all this going on in this world, with, and, and you know all that's going on with the news, and, and, and this news broadcast says one entirely different thing than this news broadcast, and this Twitter, and that Twitter, and this Facebook, and People are on Facebook, brothers and sisters in Christ, and physical brothers and sisters with varying opinions, and it gets so heated that they start deleting each other with friends. But if you don't agree with what I say, I have the facts, or I work in such and such profession, and therefore I know what's true, and you guys don't, and it doesn't matter. There's doctors who disagree. There's high-ranking doctors who disagree. There's all kinds of disagreement. But that shouldn't be breaking the unity, and yet it is. And there's something wrong with that. As the body of Christ, we're supposed to be in unity. And we're going to look into some scriptures today to show how important this is. 
Let's start out. Let's go to our next slide here. This is Ecclesiastes 4.9. We're going to read a few verses to show what God used Solomon to say about unity. Two people are better, than, better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. Do you know that? Do you know what? If you go, uh, like, even sometimes in business, a business partnership, a marriage. Didn't God say it's not good for the man to be alone? He made us a woman. My, I, I, couldn't be, I couldn't get along without my wife. We've been married for three years and then working together in ministry and in the household. Uh, the, having, having her makes us so much stronger. Do we disagree on a lot of things? Absolutely. I have a totally different opinion on many things than she does. She has a different opinion. Does that mean we have to split up over that? Because you better agree with my opinion. No, you better agree with my opinion. You still aren't convinced to see it my way. They're not going to be. You know, as many different fingerprints as there are in the world, there's that many different thoughts and, and uh, thought patterns and opinions. That is not reason to divide. But there would be 7 billion individuals on earth that would never stand together. We all have different thoughts. We all have different characteristics. And we should be okay with that. There's unity and diversity. In our school, we have almost 20 nationalities in a small group of kids, 113 kids we had last year. That does not mean there should be uh, division. That means there's d people from various countries and different origins and not races. I don't want to use races. It's not different races because there's one race. But the unity comes from spirit. And we need to understand that. Now let's go to the next verse, verse 10. He says, if one person falls, the other can reach out and help. If you fall down, it's good to have somebody there to pick you up. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. You go along, you walk along, and you fall down into a ravine, and you're in real trouble if you don't have somebody to help you out. I know the Lord can help you, and he does, but God has us help each other. So many times as the body of Christ, we say, well, I'm praying God will help you. God's saying, I am helping them. I'm telling you. I'm telling you to go give them $100. I'm telling you to go give them a meal. They're at home. They need help. I'm telling you to go minister to them. They're in their sick bed. I'm telling you to go. Well, I thought that was your job, God. That is my job. I dwell in you. I used to be in one physical body, now I'm in all of yours. And that's why Jesus said, more works than I do will you do, because I go to the Father. And now it's spirits in all of us. So he's working through us, and we need to realize that. Next verse, verse 11. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. You know, husband and wife, you, it's, it's wintertime, and when you're young, you have brothers and sisters. Maybe you share a, a double bed, and you say, wow, we're warm because... There's two people next to each other. But how can one be warm alone? Solomon said. You know, being alone is not good, and God realizes that. But there needs to be unity. Now the next verse. He says in verse 12, A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. You know, this happened with David when he was younger. He and Jonathan, which was Saul's son, went out and attacked the garrison of the Philistine, and they got in a narrow place, and they put their backs against each other, and they warded off a whole garrison of the Philistines because David was on this side with the sword, and Jonathan literally, we use the term, you've got my back, he literally had his back. They put their backs against each other, and they fought valiantly and defeated. If they hadn't been together, the enemy would have come around back, and when you get tacked on the back end of the front, you're going to lose. But here, Solomon's saying, Two can stand back to back and conquer, and three are even better. For a triple braided cord is not easily broken. You take a, a small rope and you can break it. You put two of them together. You put three of them together, and you've got a lot of strength. So unity is so important, and it's preached throughout the Bible. God shows us how important it is for us to be together in unity, and it comes only through his spirit. Brothers and sisters, let's see the importance of this unity and really be on guard against the divisions. And where do you think the divisions come from? One source only, never from God. Oh, I'm, I'm separating from this. I'm done with this relationship. I'm deleting you. I'm washing my hands of you. Our chemistries just don't mix. So therefore, we're going to be apart. That's not godly. In fact, the Lord even tells us, if you come to the altar, that is, you come in prayer, come in before God. We're not going to a physical altar. And you remember, and you bring your gift. Well, I'm just coming before the Lord. And you remember that your brother has all against you. I don't have anything against him. And if he has a problem, that's his problem. No, your brother has all against you. Leave. Leave. God's saying it's already okay between me and you vertically, but it's got to be okay between you and your brothers and sisters. Leave. First go be reconciled to your brother. 
then come back and talk to me. So let's go to our next, our next verses here. We're going to go to the book of Mark. This is the words of Jesus, so we need to pay really close attention. This is the word of God Almighty. His name is Jesus. People say, oh, was that God or Jesus? Jesus is God. There's only one God. There's not God, and then there's a little, the Son of God is something different. He's a prophet. No, he's God. He says, and if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Civil war will tear down the country faster than anything. Our nation is ripped right now, and on purpose, the division, the created division, and two parties and all this, they're dividing us on purpose because you can control a divided population. You just use one to combat the other, and you don't have to fight them at all. But if they're unified, then you can't control them. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Brothers and sisters, parents, being divided, even get on Facebook and start deleting each other, and they, they have a big problem because you feel this way about this subject, and I feel that way, and therefore we don't agree, therefore I'm not even talking to you. Seriously, this is people who are supposed to have the Spirit of God. And this, this topic is so important. Wearing an item or wearing a certain item or following a certain system is so important that we've denied own, our own blood relatives or our brothers and sisters in Christ because it's a huge matter that you see things the way I do. This is the works of the devil. This is nothing but the works of the devil to divide the body of Christ. And at all times, we need to be together. Let's go on to the next verse. This is the way it's written in the New Living Translation. A kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. If your family is feuding, stop, just stop. Stop and think about it. Is this really that important? My own brother and sister, we're not gonna talk now because they feel this way about this, this uh, hot news item, I feel this way, and therefore we're not even gonna talk. Is it really that important? Can you imagine when all this goes, finishes and this world is done, and we're standing before God and saying, you two haven't spoken to each other since the pandemic or since this or that or whatever. I'm not even going to get into particulars because I don't want to get into that. I, I'm not going to get into this feuding by the grace of God. And this was so important. This little tiny subject and this whole big blown up scheme was so important that you divided from your own family or from your own brothers and sisters of Christ. How foolish can you be? You are so deceived into taking what is holy, what is sanctified, what is unified by the Spirit of God and tearing it apart for this because your brother or sister doesn't see it the way you see it. It happens in marriages. People split marriages over the tiniest things or whatever you might call it. There's divisions in workshops. There's divisions and churches, and so many times it's over tiny things. You say, well, this is not tiny. It is tiny. It's very tiny, and the scheme, when you look at what God has designed, it really, things we see now are temporal. The things that are not seen are eternal. You're destroying the eternal for the temporal. And we need to be awakened to see these brothers and sisters. So let's go to the next. This was Jesus' word. This was the, the New Living Translation. I'm going to go to Proverbs now. I want us to take this very seriously. There are six things the Lord hates. No, there's seven things he detests. There are six things the Lord hates. No, then, then, then the writer of Proverbs comes around and says, no, no, there's seven. Not only hates, God detests these things. He detests them. Well, if he detests them, if God detests them, then I think we ought to take it seriously. And number seven, the reason he had number seven, this is actually the top one. This is, this is the crowning one of the seven things. This is a, a, a list of completion. God hates seven things. He hates them. And the seventh one is at the top. There are six things the Lord hates. No, seven things he detests. Let's look at them now. Verse 17. Haughty eyes. Oh, boy, God made me. I'm telling you, I, I, I can't help being proud because I'm just great. You know, people just have, you know, I'm just, they, they just puff up. They have haughty eyes. You know, I, I can see why everybody loves me because I'm great. You know, that's, that's kind of the attitude some people have. A lying tongue. 
Lying and lies creates all kind of division, and that's coming from the father of lies. The lie didn't originate with you. You're being used by the father of lies. Hands that kill the innocent. Hands that kill the innocent. And boy, they are killed by the hundreds of thousands now. Innocent babies and others. It's murder. It's, it's, it's killed. Don't, don't, you know, we're not going to get in. Oh, I'm going to battle my opinion, and, and you know, I'm, I'm pro-choice. Well, you do have, I'm pro-choice, too. When you got in bed, you had a choice. And, and now you don't, because that's a living soul. At, at the moment of conception, it's a living soul. But uh, I'm not going to get into that right now. This is not an abortion debate. This is things God hates. And there's other ways to kill innocent. You can kill people verbally. You can kill their spirit. You can kill their soul, or not their soul, but you kill their, their hope. You can destroy people, too. We need to watch out for that, the gossip and the backbiting. Let's go to the verse 18 now. A heart that plots evil, I'm going to get even. You know what? You did this to me, and I'm going to think about how to get back at you. Feet that race to do wrong. Boy, there's a, there's a fight going on. Pew, I'm going to be down there. I'm going to join in. We, we race to do what's wrong and other things. Race into sins. Race into all kinds of problems. And let the Lord speak through this. I'm going to get to our verse. Verse 19 now. Let's look at this one. A false witness who pours out lies, lying against people, little well, it was only a little lie. They didn't exactly say it that way, but I made it that way. Here's number seven. A person who sows discord in a family. Discord means division. People who bring in little things and divide families, God detests. God detests sowing discord in the family. The first institution on earth is the family. The second is the government. The third is the church. The church came later through Jesus Christ. The first institution God established on earth is the family. And the, in the last so many years, the, the people who want to destroy the, and take over went after the family. Let's destroy the family, and then we can conquer. Let's get in there. Let's make the economy so bad that the woman has to go to work, the children are left alone, the state will raise the children, and let's crack up the family, and let's put in no-fault divorce, and let's get these families broken up, and let's just totally destroy what God has instituted because they're anti-God and anti-Christ. He who sows discord in the family, God detests. And we need to be on guard against this. Because there is discord in families now like I've never seen before. Over disagreements on subjects, they're basically very controversial anyway. I'll put it in those words. Let's go now. Let's go to, so now more than ever, we really need to be together. These are the last days, brothers and sisters, and we, as the body of Christ, need to stand together. So we're going to have the whole world against us. We had the devil bearing down on us. And yet we're not even standing together because we're disagreeing over X, Y, Z that was on the news. What an easy way to be conquered. The enemy has totally deceived us by these methods. Let's go to our next scripture here. Or first. So as I said, I witnessed the families. I witnessed families, church families, co-workers, and friends splitting and feuding through these political issues during this time. But people, let's count the cost. Count the cost of what you're doing. I, I told a person the other day, I said, I beg you to go to your family and be reconciled. Don't let the devil destroy your family. Don't let the devil tear down your family through this. This is the works of the devil. Do you really want to be divided when God's given you a family and he's given you such a great relationship and now these topics came up and you're totally divided from one another? Count the cost, please. Count the cost of what you're trading off. God has given us blessings. Having the Lord is the greatest blessing. Having a family is the greatest blessing on earth. And you want to tear that family apart over, over an issue that's a political matter? Count the cost, please. Now, let's go. I'm sorry. Next scripture now, Galatians 5.15. Paul said this. He's saying to, to the people of Galatia, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now. If you're going to keep on doing what you're doing now, but if you're going to always be biting and devouring one another, you need to watch out. Biting and devouring, backbiting. This person walks out, we talk about them. We talk about this person. We're backbiting on this person. We're talking about this one. And we're devouring one another verbally. He says, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. You're going to destroy the body of Christ. You're going to destroy your church. You're going to destroy your family. And why? Who are you giving into when you do that? 
Actually, we are actually told in the scriptures that some already, through gossip, already turned aside after Satan. Because that's exactly who's behind all that. Who's behind this division? Who's behind this lack of unity? God said, my spirit brings unity, and the devil wants to cut it. He wants to get in there and cause the family, the household, to fall through feuding. And we need to be beware of it. We need to be aware of it, and we need to reach out and say, God, I surrender for your spirit to dwell in. And you know what? I don't care about my opinion. You know what? When Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice means every day we're still alive, but we're sacrificing. Sacrifice my ways. Sacrifice my opinions. You know what? You have a different opinion. I am not going to try to convince you. If God shows you different, I feel like God's speaking this to me. I know he shows you, but you know what? Maybe he's going to show me. Maybe he's going to show both of us. Maybe we're both wrong. And if we just humble ourselves and strive for the unity of spirit, that's what we need to be doing. Now let's go to our next scripture. This is Ephesians 4, and we're going to read several scriptures here. Very, very important scriptures. Paul starts off with, therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, and Paul actually calls himself the slave of God. He's totally surrendered. I belong to God. I beg you, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. Have you been called by the Lord? If you know Jesus Christ, you were called. You didn't call God, you didn't search God, God sought you out, and he saved you. Paul says, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Do you realize what that means to be called? Out of all the people in the world, you've been called and made a child of God? Now let's walk worthy of that, and he's going to explain how. Let's go to verse 2. He says this in verse 2. Always be humble and gentle. Humble and gentle. Humble means I'm not. No! I have the right opinion. I know I've been doing me a study. I've been on the internet. I read me 17 articles and I'm the authority on this. I have a degree in what you call it and therefore I can tell you this is the way it ought to be. I went clean through school and I'm telling you this is the right way and I'm smart. No. Even when we come, we come in fear and trembling to even to present the gospel. Come humbly. You know what? I could be wrong. Oh, wow. You could be wrong. That, you know, we need to have some humility and gentle. Come gently to people. Okay. All right. I hear you. I, I understand that's how you feel. I, I don't quite feel that way, but that's okay because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And you know what? Uh, if we can discuss issues, but we're not going to argue. And I'm definitely not going to try to convince you to think the way I do. And I'm not going to think the way you do at this time. So let's, uh, let's leave it at that. And how about uh, we have some fellowship now. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Did God not make allowance for us? Did he judge us on our sins? As Christ Jesus has forgiven you, so forgive one another. Did he forgive you when you came groveling? Oh, I confess I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. No, he forgave me at the cross before I was ever born. I'll forgive them when they come and they get down and say, I was wrong and you were right. I want people to know that I was right. And when I get on Facebook, I'm going to say, all right, mark my words. I want people to know that I'm a great prophet. So I already told what was going to happen. Didn't I tell you this was going to happen? Wow, see how smart I am? I'm brilliant. And we destroy one another. He says, make allowances for each other's faults. You know, I have a book, Church Management and Conflict. Do you know that studies show that in a good conversation, if I'm standing talking to you, in a real good, well-communicated conversation, 30% of what I'm thinking and feeling will get across to you. 30%! That means 70 doesn't. Oh, you said, no, that's not what I said. Well, that's what you meant. No, that's not what I meant. You see, there's a lot. So let's make allowances for each other's faults. Because of love. Love shows allowances and forgives. Verse 3. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit make every effort this means it doesn't doesn't just happen we need to make the effort to forgive to be gentle to be humble to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace binding yourselves together with peace peace if there's not peace then it's not from the spirit if you say, hey, this place has turned into the turmoil, this, this thing ought to be sharp enough to tell you 
that there's something wrong, that there's not unity, and it's definitely not the Spirit of God. There's a Spirit, but it's not the Holy. It's another Spirit, and we need to be on guard. As children of God, we ought to see that and make every effort to keep ourselves united in the Holy Spirit of God, binding ourselves together in the bond of peace. That's what should be happening. Now, verse 4. For there is one body, body of Christ, there's one spirit. Why have the Holy Spirit? So uh, there's only one Holy Spirit. So I'm in the body, you're in the body, and we have the same Holy Spirit. Just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There's one body of Christ, there's one Holy Spirit, and there's one glorious hope. There's not different hopes. So you see where this is going? You see why the Lord's doing this? No, there's not, there's not several ways. There's one way, it's Jesus Christ. And with this division, neither one of you are on the way to Jesus Christ. Because if there's a fight, there's pride. There's never an argument if even one person is humble. You know, there's no argument. Proverbs says where there's no wood, the fire goes out. So if you come and you throw a burning log at me and I just say, well, I'm very sorry. Guess what? The argument's over. If you come and you're making an accusation where well, you're this and you're that, you're that, and I say, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that. Guess what? There's no argument. If there's an argument, it's because there's two proud people. Well, y'all got to set you straight. I don't need to set you straight. If you have a wrong opinion, God will set you straight. I just need to be humble. If there's no wood, the fire goes out. And a soft answer turns away wrath. <laughs> My father-in-law told about a man on the train years ago. He was going through there, and he was angry. The conductor said, I think there might be some seats up front. There's no seats, and the man was angry. I want to sit down. He said, I think if you go to the front of the train, there might be some empty seats. He goes squeezing through people, gets to the front, and he came back to the conductor. You said there might be seats, and there weren't any seats. And the conductor said, I'm sorry. And the argument was over. I'm sorry. He thought there were, and there weren't. He couldn't then say, hey, I only work here. I was trying to help you here. You, you go find your own seat. The argument ended. A soft answer turned away breath. I'm sorry. You know how many arguments would be over in marriages if we just said, I'm sorry? Instead of trying to prove, I want everybody to know. I want to tell you my husband's lying. I want to tell you I'm right. I, I do everything. I'm, I'm so good. I'm such a good wife and my husband's horrible. Or my wife just picks out, you know, I, I, I do everything right. I don't know what my wife's problem is. You know how women are. You know, and we just keep it going and just set it instead of just, in the first place, you shouldn't be talking to people about your marriage. You should be talking to the Lord unless you're counseling. But you, you need to sit down and just say, I'm sorry. But our pride just keeps it going. I've got to prove that I am right. I'm all right. And the other person's wrong. Let's go to the next slide here. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all, in all, and living through all. Is he living through us? If he's living through us, there's unity in the Spirit. If there's not unity, it's because we're not allowing him to live through us. We've invited him in, but he's not getting the throne. He's not getting the throne of our hearts. I still want to have rule in my life, and our rule is always detrimental. Our rule is always wrong. The works of the flesh are always destructive. We just need to surrender and be humble and let the Spirit of God lead us. All right, let's go to our next verse. Not next verse, I'm sorry. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, is it worth it? Are you so bent on, are we so bent on proving that we're right, that we're going to destroy the unity of the Spirit, the bond of peace that exists in the church? that exists with my acquaintances, that exists with my physical brothers and sisters. I'm on Facebook and you had a different opinion and you made my opinion look bad and now that hurt my pride and I'm going to slam back at you and we're going to fight. We're going to fight over this and fight over this till you see things my way. I'm going to fight with you till you become a Republican or you become a Democrat. Well, I'm, not, I'm just using those terms. There's a lot of other things. Really? So this world is ending, and what really matters is we're going to be with the Lord, and we're going to try to break this apart for this that's decaying, this reserved to be destroyed by fire. Brothers and sisters, may God help us to seek diligently the unity of the Spirit, to make every effort to stand together in the bond of peace.
God be with you till we meet again. May God keep us all in unity of spirit through Jesus Christ.